I want to welcome everyone. I'm Nellie Gontier, Education and Training Specialist at Parkinson Canada. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar entitled Advanced Parkinson's Therapies. This very relevant discussion will cover the established surgical treatments for advanced Parkinson's disease, particularly deep brain stimulation and intestinal infusion of L-DOPA and Carbidopa. The inclusion criteria, surgical techniques, and outcomes will also be reviewed, along with newer treatment options. Our expert today, Dr. Alfonso Fazano, will be focusing on each of the various therapies and discussing the benefits and the risks. Before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to inform everyone that today's session is being recorded for future viewing and can be accessed by visiting our website at www.parkinson.ca and by visiting our YouTube channel, The Knowledge Network. To ask a question or to report any technical issues at any time during the webinar, please go to the menu at the bottom right of your screen. To open and close this menu, click on the red tab. Use the To Admin button at the bottom of the menu. Clicking this will bring up a pop-up menu and you can then select Ask a Question and type it in. Every effort will be made to answer all questions at the end of the presentation. We ask that questions are of a general nature and do not seek medical advice. And now I'd like to provide a brief in introduction of our presenter today. Dr. Alfonso Fasano graduated from the Catholic University of Rome, Italy in 2002. He became a neurologist in 2007 and in 2013 joined the Movement Disorder Center at Toronto Western Hospital, where he's the co-director of the Surgical Program for Movement Disorders. He's also an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Neurology at the University of Toronto and Clinician Investigator at the Kremble Research Institute. He's the author of more than 190 papers and book chapters and also the Principal Investigator of several clinical and trials. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Fasano. Good morning, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I'll be talking about the advanced surgical therapies for Parkinson's disease. I'm really happy that Parkinson's Canada um, invited me to, to, ha to, to do this, to deliver this webinar. Uh, my name is Alfonso Fasano. I'm Associate Professor of Neurology at uh, University of Toronto, and I work at Toronto Western Hospital um, uh, uh, staff neurologist, and in particular, of the surgical program. Uh, trying to, to do my best to deliver this presentation, and I hope uh, most people will be able to to uh, listen to what I say. Uh, so these are my disclosures and uh, obviously nowadays doctors have a lot of conflict of interest uh, because of the collaborations with many industries and in this part, for this particular topic, I should say that I have a uh, um, uh, conflict of interest particularly with AbbVie that produces levodopa, intestinal levodopa, Boston Scientific, but also Medtronic, there are uh, uh, the, uh, the companies involved in deep brain stimulation. So today uh, I'm going to tell you something about um, how to treat Parkinson's with invasive treatment. In particular, uh, I will cover um, deep brain stimulation, intestinal infusion of levodopa, which is known as duodopa. And I will also end my presentation saying a few words about focused ultrasound. Uh, so this this table is just to show that uh, for Parkinson's there are many compounds, many medications, as you probably know very well, and there are different milestones in the disease. And uh, depending on where we are at, we can combine and use different uh, approaches. Uh, in particular, um, the invasive treatments are used uh, not towards the end of the disease, but at some point when in the, in the disease um, there are fluctuations and dyskinesias. And these are very effective treatment, as you hear in, in a second. Now, uh, the first question is how to uh, comment on the eligibility of a patient. So when it's time for a patient to be considered for these advanced treatments uh, that I mentioned earlier. And these are a few criteria. Uh, first of all, patients have to be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Uh, the disease duration has to be longer than four years. This is now debatable, but the reason why we prefer to wait at least four years is because in some cases, people seem to have Parkinson's disease, but then in a couple of years, they are diagnosed with something different. Uh, for instance, multiple system atrophy. So waiting a bit longer is enough to have a clear diagnosis. And also because most of the time, fluctuations and dyskinesias are not really present so soon. And as I said before, patients have to have motor fluctuations. So the alternation between off and on symptoms and or dyskinesias, um, um, because these treatments, the one we're gonna talk about today are particularly 
useful for, for the management of these problems. Uh, obviously, these problems don't have to be present. Uh, they, they, they also need to be, uh, uh, they need to be present, I mean, but they also need to be uh, bothersome. They need to have an impact on quality of life and functioning of patients. Uh, and obviously, this is uh, after all the oral drugs that are available have been tried. And um, so the patient has been tried many medications, has been followed by a Parkinson specialist, and in spite of the best intention of the doctor, obviously the disease progresses and fluctuations of these conditions make an impact. And, and so this is where um, fluctuations uh, need to be managed with uh, the advanced treatment. Exclusion criteria is basically... Uh, 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 when the disease is too advanced, uh, meaning that it is causing psychosis, severe psychosis, severe depression, dementia, or if there are other systemic conditions. And this is overall just to emphasize that this advanced treatment can, can cause more uh, harm sometimes than, than uh, inducing benefits, especially when the patient, uh, um, especially when the patient uh, is uh, old. And uh, so we're trying to help the patient, but uh, doing these procedures can be uh, can be um, uh, harmful and the patient can have side effects. So the inclusion criteria, the exclusion criteria is really meant to exclude those patients who are too fragile to undergo uh, a, an invasive procedure. And then there are supportive criteria. It's important to have people with a good response to levodopa, and that's a very important point um, because, uh, as I said, these invasive treatments we're going to talk about are good for fluctuations in dyskinesias. Those treatments are not supposed to improve uh, what is not improvable with levodopa. Um, so levodopa works fine, uh, but levodopa doesn't last many hours, and this is the good patient. But if levodopa is not able to improve, for instance, balance, uh, patients don't have to expect that doing one of these invasive treatments, balance will improve, because these treatments, this is the third time I'm saying it, are meant to improve the fluctuations and the dyskinesias. And then uh, the other important aspect is that we want to have a patient that is motivated, but without excessive expectations. These are treatments. These are not the cure of Parkinson's. These are effective treatments, but unfortunately, they don't fix all the problems. Uh, but at the same time, we want a patient that is engaged and willing to uh, uh, be better. And also family and caregivers, they are very important. Uh, and actually, we judge uh, their presence and their attitude and their ability to help in selecting patients for these treatments. These treatments are deep brain stimulation, which is an electrode that stimulates the brain, levodopa carbidopa intestinal gel, which is known as duodopa in Canada, that's the commercial name, and I won't talk about subcutaneous apomorphine because it's not available in Canada. Uh, uh, treatment selection, step two. Uh, step two of this uh, algorithm is once you say, okay, this is a patient good for invasive treatment, uh, then you need to understand whether DB DBS or duodopa is a better treatment. And let's focus on DBS for a second. We try to favor DBS in young patients, in people with a lot of tremor, uh, even when tremor is not responsive to levodopa. So that's an exception to what I just told you. Um, when they need to reduce medication and when they have problems at night. Uh, these are very important criteria because DBS works 24 hours uh, a day and is very good for tremor control more than medications. Uh, and sometimes people do so well that we can reduce medication by about 50, 60 percent. Uh, so these are all good reasons to consider deep brain stimulation. However, there are specific exclusion criteria. Uh, deep brain stimulation is a neurosurgical procedure. So if the patient is too old, it can be risky for the patient to, to uh, undergo the procedure. And we use as a cutoff age 65 years old for, or 70 for STN, which is one of the targets. People older can still do DBS, can still receive the treatment, but we tend to go to other targets. Uh, suicide risk is a problem also. Cognitive impairment, which is more than the usual that we may see in these patients, uh, are also risk factors that we need to weight very carefully. Uh, and also the risk of a neurosurgical procedure are, are very important. So we want to see an MRI of the brain before we commit on any treatment. And uh, axial impairments, so balance, speech, and gait problems, sometimes are made worse after DBS. So we want to make clear that these are uh, symptoms that are well managed with levodopa, responsive to levodopa, and therefore responsive to DBS, and they are not so severe that we are thinking that doing DBS can make things even worse. 
Um, and the third step, which is probably the most important, is when to consider these treatments. And the simplest question, the simplest, simplest answer is to consider this treatment when it's needed. Um, and uh, so without waiting too long, and this is uh, taken from a study that's been published in 2013. And in this particular study, people were randomized uh, to either continuing with medications or DBS, uh, not uh, 12, 13 years from disease onset as we used to do, uh, but like seven, eight years after disease onset, as soon as fluctuations of these conditions were kind of bothersome for patients. And this study proved very well in hundreds of patients that doing DBS earlier uh, pays off because people have a better quality of life, the red line that goes down, and this is seen as soon as five months from surgery and it's, re it's remained um, significantly different from medical treatment even two years after the procedure. Um, so as soon as fluctuations of these conditions are bothersome and medications are no longer working well, then it's time to consider one of the surgical treatments we, we're discussing today. And this is the way I explain it to patients. Uh, over time, there is a motor worsening, uh, but people are really incredible in, 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 in adapting. So this uh, blue line means the, the, uh, indicates the psychosocial adaptation. So even if the motor condition doesn't do uh, well, people are uh, very creative and find alternative ways to, um, to improve their quality of life. Uh, for instance, instead of going to work, they prefer to have part-time jobs or to work from home. Um, but at some point, the motor condition is so severe that even the psychosocial con uh, adaptation um, uh, doesn't compensate anymore. And so if we do surgery at this moment, uh, we will certainly have an improvement of the motor condition. But unfortunately, the psychosocial adaptation is gone forever. Uh, for instance, if the patient had lost his job, there is no reason uh, that even if the tremor is gone, that he will get his job or her job back. So the reason, this is the reason why neurologists and neurosurgeons need to keep track of the adaptation and propose surgery, not when the motor condition is very severe, but when the motor condition is severe enough to, co to decompensate the psychosocial adaptation. So if you propose surgery at this moment, motor condition goes up as well as the psychosocial condition. So, and now this is the first question that I want you to answer using the, the pool tool that you have uh, for this webinar. And the question is, advanced treatments should be used only for symptoms not responsive to levodopa, true or false? So uh, I told you already uh, what's the re relationship with levodopa symptoms. And so uh, I wanna give you like 30, 40 seconds to answer this question. Let me know whether you think it's true or it's false that advanced treatment should be used only for symptoms not responsive to levodopa. So let's see the pool, okay. Okay, still, still a moving target. I think we can stop now. Okay, that's it. I will say 70, 72% of people are saying that this is false. Uh, and uh, yes, good job. This is false. I'm, I'm pleased to know that most people, uh, um, you know, got the point and also that I'm not speaking alone in my office, but there are people actually listening to this webinar um, and uh, and I told you before anything that responds to it is a good uh, uh, is going to respond to these treatments the only exception as I said is probably tremor uh, because even when tremor doesn't respond to medication it can still be improved with a neurosurgical procedure particularly with DBS or focus ultrasound instead levodopa infusion will make the difference because levodopa is uh, if re infusions remains levodopa. So if levodopa doesn't work on the tremor, the same will happen after an infusion in the intestine. Okay, a few more words about deep brain stimulation. Um, you heard already that is a pacemaker, basically it's a couple of electrodes inserted in the brain of patients. Uh, these electrodes are stimulating different areas of, of the brain and they are connected to a battery that is under the chest. Um, and this battery is stimulating, uh, delivering an uh, electric pulse in the brain. This is a treatment that is expanding very fast. These are the, the, the numbers of procedures done only in the US, as you see, is over thousands and thousands. And uh, most of the increase of the growth is uh, caused by Parkinson's procedures, which is the green line. But deep brain stimulation is also an approved indication for essential tremor and also for dystonia. Uh, there are different targets in the brain, and uh, the thalamus is the easiest target uh, and is only used to improve tremor. 
Uh, then there's the subthalamus, which is beneath the thalamus. And subthalamic, subthalamic DBS improves most of the symptoms of uh, Parkinson's and also reduces the amount of medications needed, and therefore there is a reduction of dyskinesias uh, because of the medication reduction. The other one is globus pallidus pars interna, that it seems to be a bit less effective than subthalamic stimulation, but is very good for dyskinesias suppression. So although medications are not reduced with glo globus pallidus uh, stimulation, dyskinesias are very well controlled because of the stimulation itself. Uh, don't forget that this is a neurosurgical procedure, and as such, there might be uh, uh, side effects and particularly there's a 1% risk of a bleeding that makes symptoms like a stroke. Uh, so 1% is not a lot, but it's still a risk that people should be aware of. Um, in some cases, very rarely, the stroke is so severe that the patient dies in the OR, but this is extremely, extremely rare. Uh, although the, the stroke risk, as you see, is, is sizable because it's one out, out of 100 patients. There's another risk of 5% more or less of having uh, infections. Um, and other hardware complications because this is something that is implanted in the body and, and this is why um, like you know think about joint replacements uh, this these devices can be infected they can there might be malfunctioning and a while ago we did study of the literature and we found that six percent of people with Parkinson's at some point have an hardware complications in their life so again uh, a not a, a high risk but there is a risk that you need to be aware of and then there are new technologies. This is the way the stimulation works. Uh, the electrode creates an electrical field, which is basically like a bubble all around the electrode. We now have new electrodes that are able to steer the electricity uh, in a better way so that we can stimulate only the area of the brain that we want to stimulate, uh, avoiding the risk of uh, stimulation-induced side effects. Uh, there are uh, other type of stimulation where you, we can deliver two different type of bubbles, as you see, with different shapes in different locations of the electrodes. And these two bubbles are alternated um, at very high frequency so that there are two different functional zones. And there is also a newer electrode which has eight contacts. And these eight contacts can be independently controlled. Uh, and this means that we can deliver stimulation at different levels in the brain and we can have uh, plenty of options and uh, we can also um, stimulate two different areas with different parameters as you see in the animation. Uh, uh, so now question two related to deep brain stimulation. And the question is that uh, whether it's false or true that DBS is an experimental treatment. So now I'll go back to the pool to see, uh, to see what's your uh, take uh, um, about it. Uh, uh, let's see uh, what you think, whether DBS is an experimental or, uh, or uh, uh, non-experimental approved procedure. Very, very well done. 100% uh, of people are now saying that uh, uh, this is false, and that's true, you're right. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's false, the right answer. It's true that you're getting the right answer. Um, uh, DBS is, is not an experimental treatment. It's been around for over 30 years. It's been done for the first time in Parkinson's in 1987 in France. Uh, and then it got approved uh, for Parkinson's um, less than a decade, af decade after uh, in North America. So there's plenty of experience with DBS, over 20 years of DBS. Uh, so it's not experimental, but it's an approved treatment. Now, a few other words uh, in specific about intestinal infusion of levodopa, which is uh, marketed in Canada, as you heard, uh, with the name of Duodopa. And this is how it works. The patient have to wear a pump all day long. So that's one of the problems with this, is that you don't have anything implanted in your body like DBS, but you have a pump, which is this size. And this pump has a, a computer here that is programmed by the neurologist, you know, the blue part. And then there's a little cassette uh, at the bottom, which is uh, containing a gel of levodopa and carbidopa. And every morning, the cassette has to be stopped, as, uh, has to be uh, um, removed, and, uh, uh, and a new cassette has to be uh, inserted in the pump. And the pump pushes levodopa in this little tube, and this little tube goes into the stomach, and even farther down in the small intestine, in the jejunum, which is where levodopa is absorbed. So the dopa has two main advantages. The first one is that there is a pump that continuously delivers levodopa in your system. So patients don't have to take tablets anymore. The pump does everything automatically. The other advantage, advantage is that uh, 
the duodopa is delivered right there where it has to be absorbed, which is in the small intestine. Uh, uh, there are a few other things that you need to be aware of. In some patients, instead of inserting the, the tube in the stomach right away, we can do a face uh, with a test, a test face, using a longer tube that goes from the nose to the stomach and, there, and then the small intestine. So this means that the patient doesn't have any uh, uh, permanent procedure. And this can be done for a couple of weeks just to see how the patient feels. And if the patient and the doctors uh, are happy, then the patient goes ahead and does the permanent procedure in the stomach. The other advantage of this technique, that we, which we published a couple of years ago, is that this can be done without admitting the patient to the hospital. So everything can be done uh, in an outpatient setting. Uh, and this is a little video that shows the life of a patient uh, of ours. Uh, this is a man with dyskinesias, and this is a video that you might find on YouTube. Um, uh, you just need to, uh, to uh, uh, type uh, uh, the little things this is the title of this short movie, The Little Things. And this is just a, a summary, a short, an abstract of the of this short movie, which is about 25 minutes long. And this is the patient the day of the procedure. As I said, everything is done in outpatient. Um, so the patient comes to the hospital in the morning to have the PEG placement. Uh, and then the patient goes home and a couple of weeks after he can start the pump. The cassette has to stay in the fridge. Uh, and then this is the patient that uh, insert the pump, uh, the cassette into uh, the pump slots, uh, slot, and then uh, he starts the pump. And as you can see, he's able to do it by himself. These conditions are much better and he can move uh, very well. And, um, and now you'll see in a second the happy face of the wife uh, that uh, uh, certainly gained a uh, better quality of life herself too. Uh, another advantage of, um, uh, of this treatment is that uh, this is something that is delivered through a PEG, so a gastrostomy. Uh, and in some patients with Parkinson's, um, um, uh, swallowing problems impair uh, swallowing itself. So these people need to have a, a PEG in any case to have nutrition. And so these patients can receive duodopa and nutrition at the same time through the same tube. Uh, this is a treatment that's been approved not a long time ago in Canada, and it's going very fast. It's growing very well. So it's an happy story here in Canada, and, and Health Canada are really supportive of this treatment. Uh, what are the supporting criteria to consider the dopa? <clears throat> well, when the patient has to simplify the oral treatment, because most of the medications are uh, gone and everything is given by the pump, uh, uh, when there are swallowing problems, as I mentioned, when patients uh, uh, doesn't want to have neurosurgery or when neurosurgery is not possible. But the, then there are exclusion criteria. Uh, thankfully, in Canada, most centers are covered. Most uh, provinces are covered. So that's not an issue. Although for people younger than 65, there may be a problem uh, in um, getting the right coverage. But I know that the company is also helping these people. Um, a big problem are severe dyskinesias because if people are very sensitive to levodopa, uh, duodopa can still be an issue and uh, because duodopa is levodopa. And this is where we, uh, for instance, use the uh, nasojejunal test, the test from the nose to make sure that dyskinesias are really well managed with the pump before we go for the permanent procedure. Another big problem is the, the night. For people who are very dis disabled at night by slowness, Duodopa can be a problem because Duodopa is approved only for 16 hours a day. Uh, so they need to disconnect the pump at night. Uh, in some cases, we have been using the pump for 24 hours, but this is off label. And then there are other uh, little issues with, which are not very important. The most important ones here are contraindications for uh, a gastrointestinal uh, gastrostomy, so uh, gastrointestinal procedure, I should say, and this is something that happens rarely, but the gastroenterologist has to see the patient to approve uh, the procedure. What about the safety? Uh, I should say that Dudopa is quite safe uh, uh, because it's, it's levodopa, so it has more or less the same risk profile of levodopa. Uh, what can cause more problems is the gastrostomy itself um, because of the um, of the PEG placement in people who are moving because of uh, you know the better quality of life and better mobility, uh, this can create uh, some problems on, that you see listed on the right uh, at the gastrointestinal level. Uh, this happens quite often, but most of the things are not dangerous, are not particularly bothersome. And as you can tell from this graph, most of the problems happen 
um, most of the problems happen particularly at the beginning of the procedure. So we monitor the patient particularly right after the little dopa uh, is placed. And now the third question, so far you've done a great job. So let's see um, uh, what you can uh, do now. And the question is intestinal infusion of levodopa can be virtually used at any age. Uh, so if you want, uh, the question is whether there are age limitations related to, uh, to levodopa. So is it true or false that intestinal infusion of levodopa can be used uh, at any age? And let me go to the, uh, uh, your answer. Let's see, I'll wait a few more minutes because I'm, uh, seconds because you're still uh, uh, voting. Okay. Okay, I will say, 75 of patients are or or people attending this webinar, uh, okay, and now it's close to 80, are saying that uh, uh, this is possible at, at any age. And that's true uh, because uh, any, pa any patient, anybody can receive a gastrostomy. Um, actually, in literature, there are also children with this treatment. Um, and uh, the oldest patient that I've been treating with this procedure was 85. Uh, so it's not like DBS where we need to take into account the patient's age. Uh, uh, obviously, if the patient has problems, it becomes uh, you know, heart problems, respiratory issues, which come with age, then it becomes risky. But uh, in theory, uh, a duodopa can be proposed at any uh, age. Uh, and now I want to spend the last part of this presentation on a new treatment that is available now in Canada. And we decided with Parkinson Canada to discuss this treatment as well, because many patients are now asking about it. And, uh, and it's in a way related to what I told you so far. And this is the uh, MRI guided Fox ultrasound. Uh, so this is an animation to show what it is. The patient has the head shaved, has to wear a special uh, frame around the head and put the head in a helmet. And this helmet is then inserted in an MRI machine. And this MRI machine has a special device in it. There is all water going around the head to uh, cool the skin down. And there are over a thousand of transducers in this special helmet that are shooting ultrasound at very low energy from every angle. And all these ultrasound are converging in a single spot in the brain that is the target of the procedure. And this single spot is basically lesioned, is basically burned uh, uh, to improve symptoms of uh, different neurological conditions. So from what you can tell, uh, it's something that is done without opening the, the skull, but doesn't mean that this is not an invasive procedure. There is, there is a permanent damage uh, done in, in, in the brain. Uh, it's a burning of the neurons. So these neurons are killed and they are killed forever. Uh, so this is why the procedure lasts three, four hours, because the neurosurgeon and the radiologist need to be sure about the area that they are targeting. And during the procedure, the patient is awake. There is no general anesthesia so that the neurologist can also assess the patient to make sure that symptoms are, are improving real time and there are no side effects. And the patient is then evaluated right after. So that's important for me to emphasize. This is an important treatment because it doesn't require general anesthesia. There is no opening of the skull as you saw. But keep in mind that this is a neurosurgical procedure, nevertheless. Uh, and this is how it looks like. This is a thalamotomy. Uh, you remember I said the word thalamus before, which is the target of DBS used for tremor control. And the same happens for focus ultrasound. Uh, there is a lesion here. You see the brain that is cooked, basically is burned in this particular area. And then there's a little bit uh, of swelling of the uh, the, uh, the surgical um, um, targeted region. And then over time, uh, the edema, the swallowed area goes away and, and, the, the, and what you see that remains is basically a hole. This is the permanent lesion uh, uh, in, the, in the brain. Basically, these are the neurons in this particular case causing the tremor. And we basically kill these neurons to make sure that uh, the symptoms of tremor are improved. Uh, this is now an approved treatment for tremor, particularly for essential tremor, but we have been using this in many other diseases, including tremor caused by Parkinson's, and we know it works. Uh, there are a few issues that you need to be aware of. First of all is that the response to treatment is quite variable. Uh, this is taken from a very important publication uh, on many, many patients, as you can see from this line. Each of these lines represent uh, a patient, and, and the higher the line, the better the tremor improvement. In blue, you see the people who received the real procedure. 
In red, you see the people that received the fake procedure in order to rule out placebo effect. And as you see, people that received the placebo treatment didn't have a lot of improvement of the tremor, while people that received the real treatment improved a lot. But look at the variability of the response. Uh, many people didn't do uh, so great. And actually, some of them that you see um, here at the bottom uh, were uh, quite close to the same effect of, of, of the placebo treatment. So the response of this treatment is quite variable. And don't forget, this is a one-shot procedure. So if the tremor is not fully controlled, uh, we don't have any way uh, to improve it further unless we do another procedure, while by contrast with DBS, we can always adjust the settings from outside. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, we have seen also that the symptoms returned. This is the MRI of a patient uh, with Parkinson's and tremor, and he did very well at the beginning. Uh, the top left, you can see uh, the lesion in the thalamus. The patient improved. But then three months after, the lesion was basically gone. The, the brain was able to recover, uh, but he recovered too much, and the tremor came back. Uh, and then we did the procedure one more time a year after. And again, you see that, uh, that we did the lesion one more time. And this time, the lesion is a bit more visible a year after. And actually, this patient is now doing well. Uh, he has some little problems because of the, uh, the procedure, and particularly a little bit of weakness that is not gone even a year after the procedure. Um, and this is now a permanent weakness. Uh, but the tremor is very uh, well controlled and the patient is happy. And this gives me also the chance to emphasize that we have seen some side effects. They are not common, but in a percentage that goes from 5 to 10% of the patient, I, uh, patients a year after surgery, there are permanent problems. And these are a little bit of tingling, a little bit of imbalance, some weakness. It depends. Uh, so this is just to say that this is a procedure without opening of the skull, but there are still some risks that people need to be aware of. And now we are now doing this procedure in other areas of the brain, uh, not just the thalamus, but also in the pallidus, which you heard about before when I told you about these kinesias and DBS. So same effect uh, on these kinesias can be seen if we use Fox ultrasound to target, to target the pallidum. And this is something that is now under uh, investigation. We're doing a trial, a multi-center uh, international trial, doing pallidotomy, so Fox ultrasound of the pallidus, in people with Parkinson's. I need to also make clear that uh, the other difference with DBS is that this procedure for safety reasons, focus ultrasound uh, uh, for safety reasons, can only be done on one side of the brain. So we cannot do bilateral procedure, which is a problem because sometimes people with Parkinson's have problems on both sides of the body. Uh, this can be done on one side, meaning that only one part of the body, the right or the left part of the body, will be uh, improved after the procedure. And now the new way to use this treatment, focus ultrasound, is to direct the ultrasound to the subthalamus. Remember I told you about subthalamus when we talked about DBS, and it's the target that uh, improves all the symptoms of Parkinson's, the one responsive to levodopa, obviously, uh, and also allows medication reductions. And this is what being seen in 10 patients in this publication. And as you can see, look at the blue bar. Uh, this is the side operated. And as you see, right after the procedure, until six months after the procedure, there is an improvement of, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the part of the body that's been improved, either the right or the left. Instead, look at the red bar. Red bar is the side not operated. And as you see, there is no improvement on that side. Uh, the good thing in this particular case is that Parkinson is very asymmetric sometimes. So improving one side is enough for people to, to have a better quality of life. And I want to also emphasize that even in this case, uh, we have seen uh, a variability of the response. Uh, look at the green light, uh, sorry, the green line. Uh, the green line is uh, basically uh, showing one single case and you see that doesn't really change over time. The patient didn't improve and remained the same. Or uh, on the other hand, look at the right, uh, sorry, not the right, at the red line, the, the, the top one, the patient improved initially and then over time, there was a, a reoccurrence of symptoms, exactly as we have seen for tremor. Uh, and now, the last question for today, uh, focus ultrasound is the safest neurosurgical procedure for Parkinson's disease. So I want to know what's your uh, answer now, uh, whether it's true or false that uh, focus ultrasound is the safest neurosurgical procedure. So I go now to the pool. Let's see uh, what people vote. 
uh, there's no vote yet. There you go. Okay, so most people, uh, 100%, okay, no, now it's 80, 67, okay, it's moving. Okay, we'll wait a few more uh, seconds. I know this is a difficult one. Okay, count till five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, 60% of the people said that this is false, and this is the right answer. Because Fox ultrasound is not the safest. Uh, as I said, it can cause uh, 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 some symptom that remains is permanent up to 10% of the patient after one year. Uh, in DBS, we don't see these numbers because with DBS, we can adjust the settings. Uh, yes, there are risks with DBS as well, but I gave you a different numbers before. 1% risk of stroke, 5% risk of infection, 6% of hardware dysfunction. But in a year after the procedure, um, most people are doing well in terms of adverse event uh, because most of this adverse event can be reduced uh, re adjusting the settings of stimulation, which is something we cannot do with Fox ultrasound. Fox ultrasound, you get what you get. It's a one-shot procedure and induce a permanent lesion in the brain, which is attractive because, as I said, there is no opening, no general anesthesia. In theory, it can be done in a few hours and the patient is, can go home, in theory. Uh, but still, in some cases, we have seen problems, and these are the numbers. So keep in mind that this is not the safest that we have uh, available. And with this, uh, I want to thank you all for your attention. Uh, it's uh, 1240 now, um, and uh, we, we may use this 20 minutes to answer the question that you may, uh, the, you may want to ask. But before we go to the questions, um, I want to uh, give also on behalf of Parkinson's Canada special thanks uh, special thanks to Abby uh, who, um, uh, for the generous support which made uh, this webinar um, uh, possible. So thank you all. And now it's time to take your question. So I stop sharing my uh, screen. Um, I turn my camera on and now I can see uh, uh, in the chat uh, uh, th this question. Okay. Um, Okay. I just want to say thank you, Dr. Fasano. So, in the meantime, there's uh, one person that, uh, Stephen, that asked me whether there are any promising new technology in development that help get levodopa into the brain. And the answer is yes. Uh, I'm aware of some animal studies uh, where levodopa is infused with special pumps right into uh, the brain. Uh, but this is not available yet. And now, uh, uh, another question from Danielle. Is Fox ultrasound really, really uh, available on only experimental in Canada at this point? A good question. So Fox ultrasound is approved for uh, for essential tremor. Uh, so in theory, it can be done. Uh, it, it, it's done in other diseases, although it's experimental. And at this moment in Canada, to my knowledge, there are two centers in Toronto who are offering this treatment. And um, in Alberta, I think there is um, uh, um, Calgary. And uh, and I don't know whether there are the standards at this moment. So it's it's possible to to have it done in Canada too, even in experimental situation. And now there's a question regarding DBS. How long do the benefit last? That's a common question that I receive all the time, uh, and it's an important one. So DBS improves the symptoms responding to levodopa, uh, and so forever. So if you're talking about slowness responsive to levodopa, it will last forever. Uh, I can tell now that with over 20 years of experience, the DBS works forever in terms of tremor, dyskinesias, and fluctuations. Unfortunately, not everything remains uh, sensitive to treatments. Uh, for instance, balance, freezing of gait, speech problems, dementia. Uh, these symptoms over time can surface, unfortunately. A question from Alan. With either DBS or levodopa pump, does the entry to mean that you can swim or take uh, aqua fitness classes? Very good question. With DBS, you can swim. You can do what you want. Just be careful with the temperature because if you're going for very high uh, temperature, uh, like a hot, very hot sauna, uh, the the temperature can be transmitted through the uh, through the electrode. But in terms of you know swimming in a lake or in the sea, there's no problem. Uh, with Drodopa, it's a little bit more problematic. In theory, you can swim, but we don't recommend it because, uh, in theory, the, the, the water is not clean, so you have a risk of having an infection of the stoma. <clears throat> uh, 
So the question now I have is, who is not a good candidate for the Duodopa pump? Well, in theory, a lot of people are good candidates for Duodopa pump. It's the easiest that we can propose because there is no age limitation. Doesn't matter if the patient has cognitive problems, depression. Um, however, <clears throat> I, I think it's not a good candidate for Duodopa people with uh, very severe dyskinesias because of extremely um, sensitive response to levodopa. Uh, also, young patients want to travel. Uh, these are not very good candidates because they need to go around with, with a pump. Uh, or, yeah, more or less, these are the, the, the problems. Um, uh, then I had another question. How many neurosurgical procedures occur in Canada annually? Um, okay, this is an interesting question. So um, in terms of new placement in our center in Toronto, we do around 100 uh, procedures a year in terms of DBS. In terms of uh, focus ultrasound, I think we do around 20 procedures a year. Um, and we do uh, probably half the procedure in, in the country. So I would say in terms of DBS procedure in, in Canada, there are like 200, 250 procedures a year, I guess. Uh, uh, this is a, like a high estimate. Uh, Fox ultrasound, hard to tell, probably is around 50 procedures a year at this moment. Um, then I have a question from Anne. Uh, what is the latest, uh, latest treatment for freezing? Okay, uh, freezing uh, um, is a very difficult uh, symptom uh, to treat. Uh, is a problem of walking where patients feel that uh, uh, patients feel that um, uh, the the feet are glued glued to the floor and they can they're stuck and they cannot move. Um, and sometimes it doesn't respond to medications or these treatments that we talked about. So this is why we need to go for experimental treatments from time to time. And at this moment, there are uh, in particular two treatments that I think I need to uh, emphasize. One is the DBS of a target called PPN. It's an experimental target very deep in the brain. And the other one, which is way less invasive and more uh, and safer, that is called spinal cord stimulation, which is inserting an electrode over the spinal cord in the back. And it's safer, although we have seen variable results. Some patients do better, some others don't do so great. Uh, and then don't forget that for freezing, a very important treatment is rehabilitation and, and exercise. Now the question is how can we how can people with Parkinson's get into clinical trials for focused MRI guided ultrasound? Um, well, they need to evaluate it by centers that are part of trials, and uh, I think at this moment we are uh, enrolling patients as well as Sunnybrook uh, in Toronto. I'm not sure about Alberta. I don't think they're doing uh, trials at this particular moment. So if you want to be evaluated for this trial, you need to ask your neurologist or GP to refer your case to Toronto Western, so to my attention, uh, Dr. Fasano, or to uh, Sunnybrook. Um, another question from Tammy. Is the age exclusion of 65 an absolute or could patients still qualify? No, age, as I said all the time, is, uh, uh, is a, a number. So we can, in theory, propose treatment to anybody. Um, and actually, 65 is a very conservative uh, cutoff, uh, particularly for DBS of the subthalamus. Um, I would say the real cutoff is probably 70. But even in this case, we have done procedure in people much older, 75, probably rarely over 80. But uh, over 70, we really need to evaluate the patient's MRI, cognition, all the other symptoms. And we also need to evaluate the target because what is very important age-wise is, um, is uh, when we discuss subthalamus. The other targets, particularly thalamus, and in a way also GPI, are safer and can be done at any age. Um, Okay, what are the risks uh, of, another question, what are the risks of duodopa pump if you are having surgery for another condition? Um, I, I don't know whether I really get this question. I should say that in theory, there are no risks. Uh, people can have any other uh, type of surgery. Uh, obviously, during the other surgery, uh, the pump has to be disconnected and any other thing can be done. So there's no problem with uh, general anesthesia, using other drugs and so forth. How about apomorphine? Apomorphine is a very strong dopamine agonist. Uh, I have experience with apomorphine because I've been using it when I was in Europe. It's been around for 30 or more years. Um, actually, it was initial publication in 1979, but <clears throat> it's not approved uh, uh, in Canada <clears throat> in terms of a pump. In, in Europe, it can be used uh, as a pump treatment, 
meaning that it's a continuous infusion of a very strong drug, which is apomorphine. In Canada, it's available as Penjet, so people can get, g- give themselves an injection of apomorphine when they need a boost uh, to feel better with a little needle uh, subcutaneously. Um, uh, it's a good drug. It works very well. It's a strong drug that works fast. The problem I have with apomorphine is that it's a dopamine agonist, and therefore it may have the problems of dopamine agonist, like uh, impulse control disorders, nausea, low blood pressure. It doesn't mean that people cannot try it. Another question from Donna. <coughs> have you heard of permanent implant ag- acupuncture? No, I haven't heard about it. Uh, I should say that... Uh, since I haven't heard about it, it means that there are not studies. Uh, and unfortunately, in medicine, we need good studies uh, to prove that something works. Uh, in principle, I'm not against acupuncture. Some, in some patients, I actually recommend it. Uh, but I've not heard about permanent implant acupuncture, and there's not a lot of evidence to say something against or in favor of it. A question, are there risks uh, during surgery with general anesthesia for someone with DBS? So I'm assuming the patient is already having DBS, is already have a DBS implant uh, in the body and then is having another procedure in general anesthesia. The answer is no, there are no additional risks, but keep in mind that having Parkinson's per se increases the risk of complications after general anesthesia, Uh, more confusion, uh, hallucination, slow recovery from the procedure, but everything can be done Uh, in Parkinson's patients. Just people need to be aware of the fact that the recovery after the anesthesia is a little longer for Parkinson's patients. Um, Okay, and uh, I have a question from Pamela. How are the targets? Uh, I don't really understand this question, but I can say that uh, targets means that there are different spots in the brain where we can either insert the electrode or uh, use focus focus ultrasound to kill these neurons. And actually, these targets are, are, are a bunch of neurons, are groups of neurons in specific areas of the brain that we know um, quite well. And, uh, and depending on where we address our attention, so what type of targets we use, uh, we, we might have different effects. Just to summarize, if you target the thalamus, you only improve tremor. If you target the subthalamus, <coughs> you improve tremor, bradykinesia, dyskinesia, fluctuations, rigidity. If you, are, if you target the globus pallidus, you have the same effect of subthalamus, so you improve pretty much everything, but it's a bit less effective than subthalamus, with the exception of a very strong effect for dyskinesia and dystonia. A uh, question from Helen. Can a person with DBS have uh, a re- rhizotomy for chronic pain management? That's a very uh, important question, because not all the procedure can be done in Parkinson's patients with DBS, especially when there is the use of electricity. And the reason is very simple. The, this patient have electrode implanted in the body. Uh, so uh, um, this electrode can, uh, can transmit the electricity that is delivered in a specific part of the body to the brain, into the brain. So um, uh, I would say in principle, that's possible to be done, but the neurosurgeon performing the rhizotomy need to be careful, need to stay away from the electrodes, from the battery, from the wires, and need to use special type of um, equipments they don't have a large electrical field, and uh, so it has to be discussed very careful ahead of surgery. <clears throat> if you, another question, if you have a DBS implant, can you also have an intestinal infusion procedure done? The answer is yes. Uh, we have done so far eight. We've been uh, working on these cases. We published them very recently uh, in a collaboration with um, uh, London, Ontario. Uh, we reported our experience, and uh, the answer is yes, as I said, and you get the advantage of DBS, for instance, in terms of tremor and dyskinesia management, and the advantage uh, of uh, duodopa infusion in terms of uh, fluctuations, for instance. These patients do better, they don't do great, but I should also say that if a patient ends up having DBS and duodopa, it's, it's because probably has, uh, he or she has a more aggressive disease, so that's why it's difficult to comment on the outcomes. Um, <clears throat> question from Steven, if exercise, imp- uh, if exercise improves PD symptoms, can the effects be simulated through any uh, technique, uh, uh, for instance, hormone therapy? Hmm, good question, interesting question, uh, pretty much like uh, doping for a- a- athletes. Um, I'm not sure whether someone has looked into that. Um, 
and probably nobody has done it uh, because at the end of the day, exercise the, is the best uh, for many reasons, not just because with exercise you lose weight, uh, but you also, be, also because you train your cardiovascular system. So it's not just a matter of improving Parkinson's, but also a matter of improving all the other things. So exercise doesn't only uh, improve few things, but as a widespread effect on the body. This is why probably nothing will, will be really as good as exercise. And this is now known because uh, it's been done in animal. It's known that during exercise, there is a, a delivery, uh, a release of growth factors in the brain, particularly GDNF, it's one of the growth factors. So while people exercise, the brain receives more growth factors uh, and there's no way <clears throat> we can do, we can induce growth factors, we can give growth factors to people. There have been studies in the past delivering growth factors in the brain with neurosurgical techniques, and these studies haven't been so successful. Probably the good old natural way to do so, so exercise is the way to go. <clears throat> and then um, this is the last question I see here on my chat, uh, which uh, advanced surgical treatment uh, is the most effective on both the motor symptoms and pain? Oh, this is a very important question. Uh, uh, because um, uh, pain is a very common symptom in Parkinson's patients. And I would say there are two types of pain. There are pain that are <clears throat> related to a motor condition, so like excessive rigidity, uh, as excessive dystonia. And in this particular case, any of the procedures that I mentioned can work. Uh, so DBS, Duodopa, Fox ultrasound, as long as we improve the rigidity and the dystonia and or the dystonia and therefore the pain will improve. But in some cases, pain is not caused by a motor problem, but it's more like a non-motor symptoms, it's like a psychiatric symptom. Sometimes it's related to a sudden withdrawal of levodopa. So there are people who are exposed to levodopa for years and they develop a sort of addiction to levodopa. And when levodopa goes down in their system, pain comes up. And in these particular cases, the most effective is probably levodopa infusion because we are still giving the same compound that relieves the pain, which is levodopa. I should also say that in few cases, uh, pain is there, doesn't improve with levodopa, is not related to, to um, uh, dystonia or rigidity. And so in these pa particular patients, it's very difficult to improve pain. Thankfully, these are very rare situations. And in these cases, uh, none of the treatments that I mentioned uh, will work. I have another question. Have any of these therapies had beneficial effects on the non-motor symptoms as well? The answer is yes. Mm. We have more literature for uh, levodopa infusion and DBS. And <clears throat> so uh, pretty much the answer is, like I said, for pain, if the symptoms that we're talking about responds to levodopa, it will respond to uh, um, levodopa infusion. Many non-motor symptoms respond to levodopa. Uh, restless leg syndrome, uh, urinary incontinence or urgency, uh, depression, anxiety, all this pain, all these symptoms improve with levodopa infusions. What happens with DBS? DBS is a bit more variable uh, because, <clears throat> for instance, uh, restless leg syndrome doesn't improve with DBS. Actually, it can get worse because we lower medications. Same is for depression. Instead, urinary function improves with DBS. Um, uh, and the other thing I would like to comment is constipation, which is a very common problem in Parkinson's, and very often is made worse by medications. And this is where <coughs> duodopa can make things uh, uh, better, although uh, because we stop dopamine agonists, for instance. Uh, but um, probably in this respect, DBS is the most effective because with DBS, we can lower even more the medications, and these medications can make constipation worse. Um, uh, okay, and then a question from Pamela. Um, oh, how are the targets for focus ultrasound determined? Um, that's a good question, and this is uh, because of the visit uh, 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 with the neurologist that is needed before uh, being seen by a neurosurgeon. Uh, basically, the symptom, or the, the targets are de determined, uh, determined uh, depending on the symptoms that are more uh, bothersome to the patient but also the patient's feature itself. For instance, if the patient is very disabled by uh, dyskinesias, but the patient is 80 year old, um, um, well, we do focus ultrasound, we may possibly do it. Uh, and instead of doing thalamic focus ultrasound, which won't do much to dyskinesias, we do polydotomy. Um, 
okay the question now again from pamela is why is okay probably the question is about why don't we have long acting oral medications so uh, like long acting levodopa um in canada there is a long acting formulation of levodopa which is cinemat cr and doesn't really work well for during the day it's been uh, developed in the 80s and unfortunately it's been found not to be so effective on fluctuations and actually sometimes it makes these conditions worse in the us there is a Ritari, which is a long-acting levodopa, which is better than Cinemat CR. It's not available in Canada. The reason why is probably because pharmaceutical companies don't want to invest money, unfortunately, uh, in a small market like Canada. Unfortunately, uh, we uh, we need to uh, wait and see whether uh, this is going to happen. Um, and obviously, this is the downside of medi medicine in the Western Western countries. You only have what uh, it's approved, and you have what is approved because of a company that is investing money in something. Uh, uh, I've, uh, okay, now Donna is not, not asking any questions, just thanking me for the webinar. I, I'm glad that helped. Uh, thanks, thanks for your word, the uh, words, Donna. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Okay, there is. Uh, um, okay, so I think. Uh, with the last message I'm receiving means that we are done in terms of questions. Uh, so uh, I, I think I'm done talking right now. I talked quite a bit. And I want to thank you all again for your attention. And, and again, Parkinson's Canada for allowing me to, to uh, deliver this webinar. And again, Abby for uh, the uh, generous, uh, unconditioned support. Thank you all. Oh. Well, thank you, Dr. Fizzano. Please do not log off yet. Parkinson Canada values your feedback, so we ask that you wait until the end of this webinar to be redirected to a brief survey on today's session. On behalf of Parkinson Canada, I want to thank our presenter, Dr. Fizzano, our event sponsor, AbV, and everyone here for participating in today's webinar. For more information on advanced surgical therapies or to access a recording of this webinar, please visit our website at www.parkinson.com. If you have any further questions regarding today's session, please feel free to contact us by email at info at parkinson.ca or call us toll free at 1-800-565-3000. And as we sign off, we at Parkinson Canada would like to wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you.